Okay, everybody. Welcome to another of our Wednesday yachting luncheons. Uh, it's fun to be here at the St. Francis Yacht Club, especially looking out these beautiful windows at our beautiful view. Um, out those windows right now, you see the uh, Club 420. A Club 420 is like an International 420, but uh, modified to handle the abuse that clubs provide. Um, the North Americans have 100 competitors, which is terrific. Our Commodore, Paul Heineken, won in 1966 while he was a student at uh, Princeton. He won the Nationals in uh, 420, so uh, good on you, Paul. Also, I want to take this moment to introduce my longest term buddy at this yacht club. He and I have been friends since we were both Sea Scouts in 1957. He's just here from Baja, California. Welcome back to the old YC from Mexico, Sheldon Coy. Sheldon. Long time, long time buddy. Great to, great to have you here, Sheldon. A little bit about future speakers. So, um, you want to come by in October to listen to uh, Anna Marie Schulte, author of Sparrowhawk on the Horizon. What was the Sparrowhawk on the Horizon at which she speaks? It was the long, low, black scooter called America, so she's written an incredibly cool book about the early days of the Yacht America, after which trophy was named? The America's Cup. The America's Cup. Cup. America's Cup refers to the yacht that first won it. Uh, in uh, September, you want to come by September 26th, Michael Brodsky will be here. He was the attorney who headed the Save the California Delta Alliance, of which uh, the victorious attorney, I should say, they basically saved us from two giant sucking machines in the Delta, which would bypass San Francisco Bay with Delta water, thank goodness. Uh, Mort Beebe will be here in September to talk all about his recent trip and photographic essay of China. On September the 11th, Susan Rooney and Graham Beale will talk all about the Big Boat series and the great boats they'll be racing here. And in August um, uh, 21st, uh, we will have, uh, you, you've seen her, well first of all, August 28th, we'll have uh, Chip Merlin, the owner, the new owner of the yacht Merlin who will be talking to us about the transpack he's about to start. He's in L.A. right now about to start it. And August 21st, you've been watching the news about the movie Maiden and Tracy Edwards, who skippered the first Americas, the first American, the first female, all-female crew to race in what was then the Whitbread and then the Volvo around the world race. Well, Tracy will be here. She'll be our speaker August 21st at the Yacht Club, which was quite a great um, fine. We're happy to have her come speak. Um, George Jacob will be here to talk all about the new uh, Ecoterium. It's kind of like an ecosystem, but kind of like an aquarium that we have now in San Francisco. Um, how to be a bar pilot. Art Garfunkel will be here in August. Um, we'll have Stan Honey here on July 24, talking about uh, the uh, new double-handed mix crew for the offshore uh, race in the 24 Olympics, 2024 Olympics, and he'll talk about the just finished uh, Transpac, and um, so we have lots of great speakers coming up. A little bit about our speaker today. If you've been sailing in the bay for a little while, you've noticed that there are more whales than ever in San Francisco Bay. Uh, in fact, uh, one recent speaker told us that at one time there were 16 uh, whales in San Francisco Bay. You may also have noticed that we have incredibly fast ships that are continually transiting the bay. They're going 16 knots sometimes inside the bay. And you may wonder what about these ships and the whales? How close do they get? What's the danger? What about these big ships and big whales? Our speaker today has been on the water since age eight. His father um, was helping, was delivering with a 45-foot wooden boat supplies to the maritime industry back in the port of Philadelphia. All through his junior years, all through his high school years and college years, he worked with his dad on tugboats and delivering supplies to tugboats into the maritime trade. And he began to get interested in science. He ended up going off to Antioch College in Ohio where he got a BS in geology and then later a PhD in geology. And he began wondering about it and studying carefully the intersection between these whales who use sound to navigate 
and ships, which make lots and lots of sound in the ocean. So uh, we want to basically welcome to our stage an expert on the subject of big whales and big ships in the same waters, Matt Larson. Matt, come on up. Thank you. Thanks, Ron, for that uh, wonderful introduction, and uh, he's, he's painted a, a more uh, uh, elaborate picture of my career than I would have painted. Uh, one, one trick, to, or one way you, you can figure that out is that uh, my, uh, with a bachelor's in geology and a PhD in geography, I'm not actually a, a, a biologist or expert on whales, but I'm going to talk to you about some of the work that's being done at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama, Central America, where I live and work, uh, and specifically focus on the research of, um, um, can we get the, where are the slides? Just push your button there. Let's see. Uh, oh, I, I can see them here. So. Okay, I'm sorry. So it, uh, to go back to the opening screen. Okay. Sorry, so you can all see that? Uh, you can see a whale on the screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. Okay. When I looked over, I saw my son, I thought, well, how dull. So, <laughs> so, um, so I, I, I'm in Central America, and I've been there for about the last six years, but I, I come up here periodically because I have roots here, and my, two of my kids are here, and my, uh, my two sister-in-laws here, so this is also a, <laughs> one, of, one, of my, one of my homes. So I'll talk a little bit today about how, um, how we can use science to uh, solve environmental problems uh, and, and try to do so in a way that informs policy with solid evidence to support the policy. And, um, but first I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the connections between where we are sitting or standing right now and uh, Central America and Panama. So if you were uh, seated, seated here uh, 104 years ago, you might know that in 1915 you would have been likely participating in the Panama Pacific Exp Exposition, a World's Fair that was mostly collections of art, spectacular collections that uh, the De Young Museum just did a, a, centen a centennial uh, review of some of that artwork. Uh, if you were here in 2015, you would have seen it. Um, so that was one of the first connections, uh, but not the very first, between Panama and San Francisco. And why, you might ask, was, was it called that? Well, there's two reasons. One was to announce the brand new canal that the U.S. had finished across the Isthmus of Panama in 1914. Uh, and the other was to announce that San Francisco's back after a horrendous earthquake and fire in 1906 that essentially knocked the city off its feet and, uh, and, and did heavy damage to the economy and of course including right here in this marina district where many buildings uh, were destroyed by the shaking and liquefaction as some of you may have observed in 1989 with the Loma Prieta earthquake. So, um, but if we, we, we can go back further in time to another connection between Panama and San Francisco, and that is the gold rush. So in 1849, Sutter's Creek gold discovered people from all over the world, and particularly in the eastern U.S. and Europe, were trying to make their way to the gold fields. And it was a tough journey. You either had to uh, go stagecoach across North America, which was just about impossible, the railroad had not been built, or sail around uh, South America, which is a long and dangerous journey, or you took a boat down to Panama and then walked over the isthmus, which was a real challenge, and not everyone survived. In fact, the road, the Spanish trail across the isthmus is called Camino de las Cruces, which means the road of the crosses. Uh, many crosses erected for those who died. Uh, in 18, uh, after the, the, the gold rushes started coming, the, the US, a U.S. corporation built a railroad, the first transcontinental railroad in the New World. It only had to go 50 miles. Nonetheless, no mean feat. Uh, and the first prices, uh, tickets for transit across the uh, railroad, across the isthmus, and mainly paid by gold rushers, was uh, $25 in gold. Uh, that's not very inexpensive back then, but uh, if it meant going around South America or maybe dying or walk walking, it was a good price. So that railroad was complete in 1855. So several big economic connections between uh, Panama and San Francisco. 
The, um, during the construction of the canal, scientists in the United States with the Smithsonian became aware that one of the, the largest, what, what at that time was the largest artificial water body in the world was being created by damming a uh, major river in Panama to allow ships to float across the isthmus. The French effort in the 1880s had failed by trying to dig a canal to sea level. It was just too, too much to, 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 for the technology at the time. Fortunately, it d didn't succeed because it would have been an ecological disaster connecting the Atlantic and the Pacific and species that had been separated for more than three million years when the isthmus was uh, extruded from, by volcanic action uh, during, uh, during uh, the last three million years. Um, so the Smithsonian uh, set foot there. The scientists were so intrigued by what they saw, they came back, they established a few wooden shacks on an island in this newly created lake, and that became what's now the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. We have about 400 scientists and staff there. We are located in about a dozen locations around the country. Our mission is to conduct basic research on tropical biology, both marine and terrestrial, and that's what this whale work that I'll talk to you today is about. Uh, I'm very proud to say that our scientists and collaborators produce um, about one scientific publication every day, every 20 hours on average, and uh, we host over 1,000 scientific visitors per year who come and study with us, work with us, use our facilities, come from more than 50 countries around the world. Uh, so that's a quarter of all nations on Earth. So most of you have probably never heard of the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. Hopefully, if you've been to Washington, you've been to the Smithsonian, and we're part of that large family. The um, picture I have here shows some humpback whales in the Gulf of California. And if you've been watching the news here in the Chronicle just a few weeks ago, there was a story maybe on the local TV as well about a humpback that came into the bay and spent a little time here. Uh, there was some concern about it because it didn't look terribly healthy. It was thin. It, it didn't look uh, good for a whale. Uh, these are migratory species. They, uh, there are populations in the northern hemisphere on the Pacific coast and the southern hemisphere. They don't tend to interact too much. Uh, many of them come uh, uh, to Central America where they feed and bear their young, mostly because of the warm water is conducive to bearing their young and raising their calves before they emigrate back to northern colder waters, which are much more productive, and I'll show you a little bit more about that. The, we know that this migration pattern has been going on since at least the Pleistocene. That's two or three million years. How do we know that? Well, if you've ever seen a whale from your vessels or seen photos, you'll often see barnacles on the tails and on the dorsal fin sometimes. These barnacles are particularly adapted to humpback, or to whales in general. Uh, and they can be identified not only uh, you know, from the animals themselves as a particular species, but also in the geologic record. So our scientists uh, have discovered these barnacles in this marine sediment in shallow waters of of uh, Central America, and uh, been able to recognize through isotope analysis, which is a chemical in the, in the calcium carbonate, that these uh, barnacles have transited from the cold waters of the Bering Sea in the Arctic, or Ant Antarctic, uh, to Central America. So the isotopic signature tells us that whales have been doing this for several million years at least. And here is a, an animation of the winter migration. If you look closely on the slides, you'll see uh, a thin red line coming from North America uh, down towards Central America, and another thin red line coming up from South America. These whales make remarkable journeys. There's about 7,000 in the Northern Hemisphere and about 10,000 in the Southern uh, Pacific, Southern Hemisphere. They can swim up to about 170 kilometers per day, maybe an average of about 100 kilometers, so probably not a whole lot different than the average speed one of your boats might make in a 24-hour cycle. The, um, they've been noted up to 800 kilometers offshore, occasionally further offshore, and uh, the challenge for these whales is that they share this environment with thousands of ships every year. 
So here in the bay, about 9,000 vessels enter every year, which is a remarkable number, uh, considering that in Panama it's not much more. It's about 15 or 16,000 uh, the ships that are mainly entering or exiting the Pacific entrance of, of the canal. Uh, this slide here shows uh, a series of tracks uh, for a one, year's, a one year record, and you can see the remarkable density of the ships and the fact that they mainly move along the coast for obvious reasons. They're going from one port to another, and that happens to be where the whales also migrate. So there's, there's challenges in this setting. Uh, during uh, the period 2009 to 2011, about a dozen whales were killed by uh, ship impacts. Uh, these were mainly humpbacks. Here in the California coast, actually the west coast of, of, of the United States, uh, on average about once a year, uh, about two dozen whales are killed, mainly by ship strikes, sometimes by being trapped in uh, gilded in, in, uh, fishermen's nets. Um, they uh, are outclassed by the vessels. There's a 300 meter freighter and uh, maybe up to 20 meter uh, humpback whales. So uh, there's, they're no match for the size. Uh, nonetheless, they do cause damage to the hulls. They also can't outswim them. Uh, so when whales strike the, uh, are struck, struck by the ships, they, the captains often don't even realize it. But they can do damage. Here's some hull damage. They can also damage propellers. So it's really not in the interest, uh, not only of the whale, but of the, the captain and the vessel to, uh, to, to be striking whales. As I mentioned, they also have a tough time out swimming. So if um, the ship's going at less, 10 knots or less, the whales can generally outswim it, although calves have a little trouble. But calves are mostly in isolated areas like the Gulf of Panama. Uh, at 14 knots, uh, most whales are going to die and it, uh, when they get hit by a ship. And at 18 knots, it's pretty much a guarantee they're, they're just not going to survive. So it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough environment, uh, and so looking for ways to <coughs> reduce the deaths, uh, but not uh, overt, to, too terribly uh, impact shipping is one of the key challenges for science and for the International Maritime Organization, which posts periodic bulletins informing mariners about the uh, areas where whales uh, are most abundant and the season and what actions mariners can take, mainly uh, avoiding certain areas if they don't have to be in those areas, particularly during breeding times, and also uh, slowing uh, velocity. So how do we know these kind of things? Traditionally, scientists would go to observation points where whales were seen frequently. It's pretty common here at Point Reyes, for example, other areas along the California coast. And of course, from the recreational industry, where people, where private sector takes uh, visitors out to see whales, uh, different ways that scientists can collect these data without huge amount of cost, uh, and they can identify the whales. I mentioned the barnacles on the tails, and you can see uh, a couple of shots here in uh, in the Antarctic, showing uh, two whales, and the the flukes, the tails have uh, an unusual set of patterns. They're sort of like our fingerprints. The, the striations on the white, the, the, the injuries that they may have sustained, or the scratches and so forth, and the bat pattern of barnacles. So all of these things can be recorded, and since the numbers are not that great, scientists are able to identify whales, give them a number, and track them through these periodic sightings. However, um, you know, you know, the chances of seeing a whale uh, and then seeing it again are not that high. So new techniques have been developed, and satellite biotelemetry is the most effective. So that was Hector Guzman, one of our researchers at the Smithsonian in Panama, using an air gun to uh, attach a radio telemetry tag to uh, the skin of a whale. These uh, tags are sterilized before they're shot at the whale. The whales generally do pretty well. They're designed to fall out after a few months. Uh, and uh, they transmit whenever the whale is on the surface, so not uh, when they're underwater. 
Uh, and these, these obviously provide uh, important advantages. Uh, with the scientists can track these data from anywhere on the planet with their computer, including maybe at the beach. And, but there are some disadvantages. Uh, not too many years ago, in 2014 or 15, Hector was doing exactly what you saw on that zodiac, uh, and uh, uh, targeting a whale on the left side of the vessel, and a whale breached on the right side and flipped the zodiac. And there's Hector and the boatman. Uh, fortunately, no injuries, although all that expensive gear is down at the bottom, the, the air gun, and the, those tags cost about three or $4,000 each, so you hate to lose those things. But uh, fortunately, Hector uh, and, and the crew survived. Uh, he did have one challenge. He's, Hector's originally from Costa Rica. Costa Rica has a different accent than Panama. So when the Panamanian Coast, Coast Guard uh, came out to find out what, uh, to render aid, they heard his accent and they started questioning him. Oh. As Hector's sitting on the underside of his vessel there floating and the sun's getting low, and they were questioning him at length about what he was doing there, why he was there. They somehow maybe thought he was a drug smuggler or smuggling people. Uh, so uh, fortunately, uh, Hector prevailed and said, look, at least if you want to question me, let's at least get to land, please. So uh, we, he, so he was able to solve that. But that's one of the challenges of working out in the ocean, as we all know. So here's uh, some of what we learned from those uh, biotelemetry data. These are sets of data, or whales, sets of data from whales that were tagged in Panama and in the Baja uh, Gulf of, uh, of Mexico there. Uh, or Baja Mexico, and you can see the tracks as these whales both move south towards the Antarctic and move north along the Pacific coast in both cases. Uh, you'll see long straight lines. Those aren't necessarily because the whale was following such a direct path, but rather from where it emerged and a signal was captured by satellite. You can see some remarkable patterns here. These whales are going far north to the Bering Sea, which is, Ron didn't get far enough in my intro, but that was my second job after I was working in Savannah. I worked on marine vessels in the northern Bering. Then I got smart and moved to Puerto Rico. <laughs> it's much warmer there. So look at these whales. They've gone all the way to the Bering Strait and down to the Strait of Magellan. Uh, remarkable journeys, and they do this because these colder waters, colder waters, are much more productive. These are great areas for feeding, and that's why so much of the global fishing fleet is also focused in these cold, uh, near polar waters. So let's get back to Panama. And I mentioned earlier that they come and they breed in the Gulf of Panama. So here's a humpback breaching right off the city of Panama. You can see the urban skyline in the background. There's the city of two million people in a country of four million people, so half the people live in that one city, which, by the way, is the first European capital on the Pacific coast, founded in 1519. So we are now celebrating our 500th anniversary. Uh, lots of fun. So here's what uh, ships do, or the ship tracks coming in and out of the Gulf and entering in and out of the the uh, Panama Canal, uh, historically over uh, a one-year data set. And then these curly lines are the tracks of whales that were uh, tagged by Hector, as you saw in the Zodiac a little while ago. And you can see large numbers of intersections between the ship tracks and the whale tracks. And as I've already explained, it doesn't usually end well for the whale, and particularly the cats. Um, so Hector, uh, through several papers that were published, and one of which was presented at the International Maritime Organization meeting in London, proposed that we confine vessels during the breeding season to a narrow track that you can see there in purple, uh, in and out of the canal. And this is only for the 50 or 60 nautical miles across the Gulf of Panama, where the whales are most abundant. And it's a 15 kilometer wide track, so five kilometers wide track inbound, five kilometers wide track outbound, and five kilometers to separate. So it's called a traffic separation scheme, TSS. Uh, the evidence was so compelling, and the uh, impact on shipping was so minimal. I mean, if you're a vessel leaving Panama and you're headed to Long Beach or Shanghai, slowing down and following that track for a few hours is not going to 
significantly, significantly affect your ETA in, in the next port. So it was adopted, and it's now a law to see. It's on the marine charts for that region, and you'll see a chart that looks like this if you ever sail down to Panama. Uh, so it's a great example of how evidence-based decision-making can lead to good outcomes. Take uh, a modest amount of science. I mean, science is not ex cheap, but it's not that expensive to do this type of work. We're not building a, a, a linear collider like we have down on the Stanford campus, for example. Um, so the, the work uh, was, a, the, the, the scheme and this nautical chart was adopted in late 2014. It's been so effective that other countries in the region have started looking at this as a way to reduce the impact in, on whale, whales in their environments. They don't necessarily have canals, but they do have large ports with a large amount of maritime uh, shipping in and out of regions. So Costa Rica was one of the first to adapt this policy, um, and it was based on some further tagging by Hector and his team and his some colleagues in Mexico. And you can see, for example, here uh, along the coast of uh, Ecuador and Colombia, the darker blue areas show on that right graph or map show the areas of greatest abundance of whales. So these are the areas where uh, mariners would need to slow down and if the countries in these regions designate TSS, tra tra traffic separation schemes, they would uh, adhere to those. Costa Rica has already done so. Uh, in these areas, the darkest blue uh, parts of the coast of Costa Rica are areas where the whales are most abundant. And uh, on their nautical charts now, uh, you can see another separation scheme there in the, in, the, in the lavender. Moving down to Peru, the Peruvian government is also looking at this question, and we can see here uh, the tagging data, uh, the whale abundance showing on the left, of course, the ship tracks, and on the right, the dark blue areas are where whales are most abundant in and out of ports in Peru and Ecuador. So this, is a, this has a, been a, a successful program uh, the science uh, is ongoing, uh, and there are challenges ahead. Uh, the feeding areas are some of the most important one, uh, pr problem areas, and you can see some humpbacks in uh, Antarctica here, uh, headed towards or headed towards Antarctica in the, in the Strait of Magellan. You can see, uh, by the way, the barnacles on the on the whale skin there, and there's Hector <coughs> dressed appropriately for weather that's not Panama. Uh, and here's another uh, example of humpbacks in the Strait of Magellan, which is problematic because it's a very narrow area, and ships don't have a large amount of room, nor do whales, to, to avoid uh, the uh, strikes. So in this dark blue area, based on the tagging that Hector did there and others have done, we can see the greatest abundance of whales in this relatively confined area. So the good news there is that if vessels can mainly slow their speed in that one area, they're less likely to uh, have an impact with a whale. So uh, again, this is a potential policy solution that based on evidence can, can uh, help the shipping industry, of course the whales as well, uh, and not terribly affect their uh, transit times. Here's another uh, uh, more expanded uh, analysis based on more tracking uh, or tagging of whales and, the t and tracking. And you can see the dark blue areas are the places where the whales are most abundant in the Strait of Magellan. There's still problems, uh, but we hope that this work will lead to more countries adapting to these uh, creatures and uh, modifying their shipping policies. So I hope I've convince you that um, evidence-based decision-making is, is often a wise choice. It's something that uh, we may lack at times in the United States. Uh, I'll, say mo I'll say no more. Uh, and that uh, a modest investment in research can help inform uh, effective policy. It doesn't necessarily have to cost a whole lot. Uh, one of the great outcomes for Panama is that with the traffic area reduced, uh, the sh chance of a whale vessel strike is down by 
95%, just by reducing the, the distance It's a great outcome, and, and it's, uh, uh, I like to say the Wales government and the private sector can all declare victory. So thank you for your time. I appreciate your interest, and I thank you so much for allowing me to speak to you today. Election. Our speaker today, Matt Larson, is an authority on whales and ships. May they not meet that often. Um, and so I'll ask questions, and if you have a question, put your hand up and the microphone and camera will find you. Uh, right off the bat, let me ask, um, do we know how many whales are in the world and how many ships are in the world? Uh, that's a tough one. Uh, in the Pacific Coast, there, for humpbacks, at least, I can say that there's about um, 17,000 humpbacks right now. Uh, for other whale populations, I, I'm not sure. There are some that are still suffering uh, from uh, overfishing, and of course, Japan has restarted uh, uh, whaling, uh, unfortunately. Um, the For the number of ships, uh, that that's a fascinating question. Uh, I, I, but I think the main question isn't so much how many vessels there are, but rather how many are transiting a given area at a given time. So we know, for example, I mentioned earlier, 9,000 ships per year enter and exit uh, the Golden Gate, which is remarkable. Uh, that's a lot of ships. And um, uh, about 15,000 are entering and exiting the Panama Canal every year, about 5% of global shipping. So actually, if someone multiplies 15,000 by uh, by 20, that's the number of, that's, I just realized that's the answer. But, <laughs> yeah. so, uh, however, that may be skewed because um, often the Canal Authority numbers are based on tonnage rather than actual vessel number. So how often does a whale hit a uh, ship or a ship hit a whale? Uh, th those numbers are really difficult to know and they're almost guaranteed to be underestimates because many ships it's not even known when you strike. Uh, I mentioned before you had a three uh, a three hundred foot vessel and a nineteen uh, meter nineteen meter whale, and the ship doesn't know it. Uh, here on the west coast, about a, a dozen, uh, two dozen per year are are are, uh, are known or, or at least documented. That's from Mexico to the Canadian border of the U.S. Uh, in Panama and Central America, that region, we estimate about. Uh, somewhere in the order of a half dozen or a dozen a year, it's probably more. So, uh, I've got, we have a question from the audience. Lance Berg has a question. Lance. So, with regards to uh, traffic separation schemes, uh, we have one here in San Francisco that's relatively new for the people who've been sailing here for a long time. And um, I have two questions about that. Um, one is, can you comment at all on any of the evidence-based schemes that were used in order to set up the TSS for entering and leaving San Francisco Bay? And second, because when it was set up, it was done with um, virtual buoys, virtual AIS buoys that are navigated by the ships. There aren't actual buoys out there that they're going around. Do you know if there's any plans to use the ability to move those virtual buoys uh, with regard to possibly seasonable, seasonal migration or any other changes in whale population? Yeah, two good questions, and I'm, I'm not well qualified to address either of them. I will say that um, um, it, it's, it's unlikely that the local authorities would have adopted a separation scheme without at least some evidence for how far to extend it in and out of the bay and, and how wide to make it and so forth. Um, so I would, I would hope and assume that there is some good evidence uh, behind that decision. Regarding the, uh, the buoys, that, that's an intriguing question and, and certainly one of the key data uh, sources for how do you assign these uh, areas for re either reduced speed or narrowing of, uh, of uh, vessel tracks. Um, 
uh, it's a re this remarkable GPS technology that we now have. And the first time I sailed on a vessel in the Bering Sea, it, it took a, a wall full of uh, computer equipment and a full-time guy to make sure it worked, uh, which is just remarkable considering what we have in our pockets now. So I, I think the, 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 the modern technologies now are increasingly sophisticated and make it ever more likely that we can well address and well manage this challenge. So, how loud uh, in decibels is a whale's signal, and how loud is a ship in terms of the prop or what are the other sounds that come off of it? Uh, another good question. We're, <laughs> we're speaking to a geologist and a geographer here. Uh, it, it's, I don't know that it's the, the volume, but the certain frequencies that whales are tuned to hear, they can hear much lower frequencies than you or I. Uh, and uh, judging by the median age in here, which is comparable to my own, we hear even less of those low frequencies. So as we age, we hear Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all have a baritone voice. But, um, so, uh, but there are certain frequencies that whales use to communicate. And you've probably all heard these lovely uh, recordings of whale songs. They're just magical. Uh, but they can, they can transmit for large distances under the ocean, uh, under, underwater, as you know. Air travels uh, much faster in water, I mean, sound travels faster in water than air because of the greater density. So whales are able to transmit and communicate over great distances. Now that's distorted by all the ship noise uh, and propeller noise and so forth, particularly in near shore offices. So it makes, oh, oh, near shore water. So that makes it challenging for the whales. So another swing at that, how far away can whales talk to each other? Uh, that I, I could not say, I don't know. Okay. How far away can a whale hear a ship? Uh, my guess is that they, my understanding is that they can be a number of miles. Uh, the question though is how well they're able to discern the track of that ship and, the, and the, if it's bearing down on them and also the velocity of the ship. These, the whales are adapted to hearing this uh, marine environment that for millions of years did not have uh, vet mechanized vet vessels until a century ago, so they're they're just not adapted to these conditions. Uh, do, are they usually? How are they hit by ships from behind, across? Generally, they're getting struck by at the bow of the vessel because uh, the, if they're uh, that, that's just where the. But are they running? Are the ships running over the whales from behind, versus colliding with them? Like that? I see. Uh, you know, that's a good question. We don't have much enough data to say whether the whale was crossing the path or, or was caught up on from behind. What are the numbers of number of collisions, number of times per year that a ship hits a whale? Uh, again, we the, it's there's very little evidence for this. We it's anecdotal, and because uh, when a ship reports a strike, they get fined. So if they, <laughs> if they can get away with it, they're, they're not going to... It varies by country, uh, and, and my guess is that it's really tough to, impo to enforce that fine and collect it. So, um, but nonetheless, it's uh, the vessel company and the captain have an incentive to not report, uh, even if they knew it, which is tough. As I mentioned, you know, the, the size of a vessel is so much bigger than, than uh, the whale that they, they probably don't know it most of the time. So how much are the fines? Uh, I don't know. It varies uh, by country. Yeah. So the typical length of a typical whale, in the cases that you're familiar with, how long are the whales? Well, the humpbacks uh, reach, they vary from 10 to 19 meters, the young being smaller, of course, females being smaller than the males. So 20, call it 20 meters, 60 feet. 60. So bigger than probably many of your vessels here. So you definitely want to keep an eye out. And so a 20, 30, 40, 50 foot whale, 80 foot whale, versus a 700-foot, 800-foot, 1,000-foot ship? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's a, imagine a gnat landing on your, your jacket. You don't even notice it, unless it's a biting mosquito. Another question from the audience. Jimmy DeWitt. Jimmy. I have a friend that was coming from Hawaii to the coast with another person on board. And he swears that whale aimed at him and hit him. <laughs> his boat, you mean? Yes, hit his boat. It bent the rudder shaft, and he couldn't make it back up to the bay, so he went down to Monterey to have all the work done on it. Does this happen very often, where a whale will attack a small craft? <coughs> I, I've heard accounts like this. Um, I. I 
can't be sure necessarily if the whale in, was eyeballing that vessel and intended to strike it, or if it was really bad luck. But in the case you're, you describe, it sounds like the whale had an attitude. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, males, and there are many in this room, are territorial. And we, uh, we try to, you know, elbow out our competitors. And uh, we've been doing this for millions of years. So as far as the whales do it, too. So we had a speaker at the Wednesday Yachting Lunch about eight years ago talk about being hit four times by a whale on the way back from the Fairlands race in their um, J-35. And the boat was actually disabled. Um, so it was a speaker before we were doing Facebook live streams. So we have had that right here in River City. We have another question from the audience, uh, Kathy Trafton. So I have a question. You mentioned, of course, that whales did not co-evolve with ships. Do whales perceive that a ship is a danger? I know some dogs will avoid cars. They won't co-evolve with cars. A lot of dogs do not uh, avoid cars. They don't really understand the danger. So I'm curious. That's my first question. My second question is about tagging whales. So when you tag them to monitor their, um, their travels, you said that the tags are designed to fall off after a few months. Why? It seems to me you go to all that trouble to get them tagged. You can monitor them. Why would you not let them stay indefinitely on the whale? Okay, uh, the first question um, is, is beyond my, my understanding. I, I, um, I don't know, and I don't know if any, how well this can, is understood, how, if, how aware whales are, although the two stories we just heard suggest that they, they do at least understand that uh, vessels uh, can be a competitor, uh, and maybe, uh, uh, and, and so who knows uh, if, if that translates to avoidance or maybe curiosity. We, you, we've all seen porpoises swimming on our bow waves and boats, so there's some interesting behaviors of marine mammals that are, are just not well understood. Uh, regarding the tag, um, it's determ been determined over the years that um, uh, if you leave the tag on too long, the antiseptics degrade and the whales can develop an infection. And so one of our goals as scientists is to do no harm. And so we do our best. And so getting three or four months of data is pretty good. And, and tagging is not that difficult, as you can see. It's, it is a little hazardous, but um, uh, we, we'd rather get more data from more whales than, than cause injury to some. So what's, how fast are whales swimming out there? Now I know they vary in speed, but what's a typical, you know, in transit speed? Is there a cruising speed? Do they go seven knots, eight knots, how fast? It's about 10 knots, so, uh, which is why, uh, Matt, which is why if a ship's going 10 knots or less, the whale has a chance of uh, avoiding it or out swimming it. So we're going to ask my buddy Sheldon Coy a question. Sheldon, in the ocean, What's a typical cruising speed of a typical ship? I know lots of ships vary, but what's the typical? Throw a number to us. Of a ship? Yeah, a typical ship out there, you know, tanker or freighter. Wait, how fast are they going? 20 to 25 knots. 20 to 25 is, is average speed. Okay, so they're going 2x the speed of a whale, typically. Okay, just want to get the convergence rates and so on. We have another question from the audience. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. I noticed that you spoke a lot about humpbacks, but what about uh, what we call California gray whales? And is a part of the reason for all these collisions that the whale population is much healthier and more abundant than it has been in the past 100 years or so? Uh, good question. The, um, I, I don't know, this work focused on the humpbacks. Uh, earlier in my career, I did work on gray whales, but this was mainly on their feeding habits in the, in the northern Bering Sea. Uh, and I, so I don't know that much about their, their current abundances. But your, the second part of your question is, is certainly likely to be the case. I mean, whaling, 19th century whaling decimated populations, uh, uh, and, and worse than decimated. Decimated means reduced by 10%, which is... So the Pacific whales in particular uh, were hunted to near extinction in some cases. So uh, with protections over the last few decades in particular, um, the populations are increasing, so, so the problem, of course, increases because we have ever more shipping uh, and uh, now we have more whales. Uh, John Pechtel has a question. John? Yes, are the Japanese whaling in the same areas that we're preserving these whales? 
Uh, well, they're not allowed to come within the, what is it, 200 uh, mile EEZ, the exclusive economic zone, as far as I know. So, so, in that, so the short answer should be no. So I noticed in your charts, of course, that the ships concentrate near ports. That makes sense, egress, regress into the ports. So ships concentrate near shore. What about whales? Are whales evenly distributed across the ocean, or are they more likely to be near shore? What's the deal? Uh, the, the, the humpbacks in particular, where this is true in general, tend to hug the coast, but within you know several hundred up to 800 kilometers offshore. So they, they can get pretty far offshore. Uh, but because the waters are, are, are they're, they're just like the ship captains, they're trying to get somewhere uh, and not meander all over the place. And also there's more abundant food sources in the shallower waters. The whales tend to be following the very similar uh, tracks and the distances from shore that the vessels are. So how far away can you keep track of a marker or a tag once you put it on the whale? How far away can you read where that whale's going? The, uh, the tags, if, if the whale is on the surface, the data are transmitted to satellite. So anywhere on the planet, as long as there's a uh, frequency of satellites overhead, the data will get picked up. And even if it doesn't get picked up on a particular uh, breaching of a whale, the next time it comes up, the odds are good that the, there will be a satellite within transmission distance. So we generally get all of the data that are being collected by these transmitters. And how often does a whale come to the surface? It's it's pretty unusual. Um, if you saw those maps, um, you'll you'll saw you saw some really long straight lines, which suggests that they can spend a long time underwater. Um, I don't know the exact number of minutes, uh, but it's uh, it's much shorter than the, those transit times. So they do have to come up and breed. They're mammals like we are, so uh, they come up and breach and, and give these spectacular scouts and spouts and, and breathe. A question from artist and great sailor Jimmy DeWitt. Uh, I had one sound right alongside of me in the Mexican race. They have bad breath. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. But anyhow, I was killing time at a bar waiting for somebody. And there was one other person in the bar, and so we started talking. This is not the whale. This is, huh? Go ahead. The whale was not the bar. The whale was not the bar? No, no. But, this is close. Yeah. He, um, we were talking, I said, oh, I'm an artist. And he says, I said, well, what do you do? He said, well, I'm a paid assassin. And I went, ooh, I bet they go, ooh. <laughs> And he says, no, what I do, I'm the head harpoonist on the whaling boat. It was, they had a whaling station just right around the corner from Point Richmond. And I can remember in races, this is what you learn when you live to be an old man. I, I went by there and I saw the whale up on this big platform being rendered, being opened up. Anyhow. So, how long do the tags stay in the whales? What's your plan? How do they they're, come out? They're designed to fall off after several months, three, four months. Uh, and that's, as I mentioned earlier, to, to minimize the chance of infection and uh, sickness for the whale. And what happens once they fall off the whale? Do you collect it somehow? No, they're lost. They, they uh, sink to the bottom and form some of the man-made trash on the bottom of the ocean. So they don't biodegrade? Everything biodegrades eventually. <laughs> Thirty take a million years. years. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yes, Kathy Trafton. So I have a question. I, I've enjoyed seeing the humpback whales in Maui and here. They really get around. I'm curious about migration. Um, what? How do they navigate? I'm interested in butterfly migration and bird migration, whales. Do you really know why they migrate, and do they ever change their migration plans? Do they follow their family's um, migration, migratory paths? Um, can they ever be coaxed to change their migratory paths? Um, it's, that's a good question. I, I don't know that we have a lot of information on how exactly they navigate, uh, but since they tend to follow uh, coastlines, they, it, it, dead reckoning is one obvious <coughs> answer. 
However, there's some populations that, uh, from the northern Pacific here, the gray, uh, the humpbacks in particular, that go back and forth to Hawaii. And so that's not an easy target uh, out in the middle of the Pacific here. So they must have some additional skills and ability to, uh, like many animals, uh, sense the magnetic field. So we know that birds, for example, uh, eat a lot of grit, and, and in the grit, the sand and soil they consume includes uh, part ferrous particles, particles that are magnetic, and that allows them to sense the magnetic field of the Earth and use uh, that form of navigation. I'm not sure how they deal with magnetic declination, but you know, they're just smart creatures. Uh, to change, uh, uh, the, the whales seem to follow the same patterns they've been following for millions of years, so it's unlikely humans would be able to persuade them to go somewhere else. Uh, just not likely. Another question from the audience. Yeah, hello, my name is... It's on. It's on. Okay, hello, uh, my name is David Schwartz, uh, also a geologist and uh, ocean conservation person. A um, couple of questions. You, you showed a graphic of the intermingling of the migrations from the north uh, region to the southern region. Can you talk a little bit about how they intermingle? And then another um, question about how your research might be applicable to coastal waters of California where we get a lot of migration close to shore and all of the shipping is close to shore. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, interesting uh, finding, and that is that the northern hemisphere whales, uh, humpbacks at least, uh, time their arrivals in Central America, the Gulf of Panama, Costa Rica, Peru, Ecuador, uh, to be offset from the southern hemisphere whales. So they're both coming to the same area, they're both using the same area, but they don't seem to be interbreeding the two different populations. There may be a little bit of overlap, but for the most part, it seems that they uh, tend to avoid each other. Now that's probably an adaptation to uh, the food availability. So, because if both populations were coinciding, the, the, there wouldn't be enough food or uh, habitat for the breeding uh, of, and calving. So, um, but it's interesting because then, it, of course, it reduces genetic diversity amongst the two populations. So, interesting question. Uh, and, and one that um, so far it looks like they're not connecting. The, um, the second part of your question, uh, yeah, I would certainly say that this type of work is broadly transferable. So uh, you can tag whales and track their, their, their patterns, their movement patterns along any coastal area or open ocean and then try to use that to develop uh, informed policies for where the shipping should try to avoid or at least uh, reduce their velocities uh, to reduce impact on whales. What's the lifespan of the average whale? How long do they live? Uh, I don't know the exact answer. My understanding is it's in the order of a few decades. And so, are you familiar with any efforts to signal uh, whales by ships, like an automated sound, I'm coming, I'm coming, or anything like that? I don't know that there's anything that's been done in that area, although I wouldn't be surprised if some classified work by the Navy has been uh, attempted. You know, we know they've used uh, dolphins and porpoises to, uh, to uh, sniff out or locate mines or even place mines on vessels. So um, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if some of that work's been done. A question of the audience, Kathy Treft. Yeah, so I, you mentioned genetic diversity. That was my next question. Um, how big are the pods in which the whales um, travel, and do they interbreed outside the pod? Um, again, it has to do with the migration question, and just uh, the longevity is also interesting in terms of migration. So the same whales would go time and time again to the same places, um, as opposed to butterflies. Right. So um, uh, the, the, they seem to travel in family groups or extended family groups of you know five to ten individuals. Uh, when in my observations in the Gulf of Panama, you'll often see four or five or six together. It's usually a female and a few calves. Um, the our understanding is that they do breed outside of these small family groups. Uh, and but how large a, a population they're intersecting with is a little tougher to know. We get uh, easily um, about two or three dozen calves born per year in. Uh, the Gulf of Panama for the humpbacks. So, um, 
you know, there's a regular uh, reproduction going on, and and, uh, and then of course these whales are migrating back to their feeding areas, uh, northern or southern hemisphere. So, what species of whale gets hit most often? Uh, that's a tough one. I know humpbacks and, and grays uh, on the Pacific coast, and then the right whale on the Atlantic coast is one of the uh, most vulnerable. And it, I don't know if you know this, it's called the right whale because for the whalers, uh, it was the best whale for uh, the products they were seeking, oil and blubber, and so it was the right one. And do calves get hit more often than adults? Yeah, the calves are most vulnerable because they just can't swim as fast. It's like, you know, you and your toddler grandkids or kids crossing uh, uh, Columbus and Broadway, uh, you, you, you definitely uh, have a better shot at making it than your toddler does. <laughs> and so, um, when you first started studying whales, how old were you when you first said to yourself, I'm going to become an expert in whales? <laughs> You're a you are once again enhancing my reputation. But you decided uh, at some point. You said, okay, whales, it's going to be my deal. I actually... Uh, was that no, last week? When was it? I, I, I had an older cousin uh, who lived in the suburbs of Philadelphia, and he was going to do a, become an, anthro, uh, an ornithologist. And so he got me interested in birds and in the outdoors, and he taught me about ecologies. And so it was really an interest in the environment and nature that led me into the sciences. And then I went on to do a... A geology degree and worked in that field, actually in natural hazards. So I worked on landslide hazards uh, in the Caribbean and in Puerto Rico and Venezuela. So I've never been an expert on whales, uh, but I do know enough about them in the work that my institute does and my staff does, Hector Guzman in particular, that I'm able to at least answer some of your questions without completely embarrassing myself. <laughs> Grace Knight has a question. Well, uh, you mentioned that these tanks fall off and go to the bottom of the ocean and contribute to more plastics. In the this week's or this month's Sierra Club, they're saying the autopsies of some of the dead whales are 40% plastic in their stomach. So you're concerned about saving the whales from ships. How about saving the whales from plastic? Yeah, an excellent uh, question. There, uh, as we know, uh, tragically, there uh, are massive amounts of plastic uh, being introduced into the oceans every year. Uh, the bulk of the plastic is coming from about 10 major rivers, eight of which are in Asia. So for the most part, we're doing our part in North America. We can obviously do a lot better, but uh, yeah, the, the, we're in this age of plastics, and uh, future geologists will look uh, if there are humans in the future, we'll look back at the, the, the geologic strata of this era and find they're, they're going to call this the plastic age because there's so much of it and it doesn't biodegrade very quickly. And how about your tanks? What are you doing to the, the, the tanks are about the size of your, your water glass there, probably a little smaller, and um, they are such a tiny fraction of global uh, plastics, uh, and in fact part of it's metal and other products, uh, that uh, I would say the, the, the benefits of our ability to tag the whales far, far outweigh the, the negative of the small amount of material we're introducing in the ocean. So while we're on this subject, how many tags do you drop a year? Uh, well, not too many, uh, and that's one of the big challenges of science. Science is not particularly well funded in our world, uh, and so Hector, for example, and his colleagues are probably tagging about maybe a dozen whales a year. Uh, and so when you consider the, 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 the magnitude of the question, the challenge, uh, uh, it's a, we're making a small dent in, in understanding the, the research question and collecting the data. Yes, a question from Jim DeWitt. I think you just answered. Can you hear me? Oh, you answered a question that I've had for years. My wife and I were up on the bow watching the dolphins play around, going by the bow as we went through it. And my wife was very observant. You said, she said, see that? Those dolphins going that way, they don't have a fin. They don't have a fin, no. So we spent years trying to find out what this thing is that doesn't, it's a dolphin, but it doesn't have a fin. 
and we finally found somebody that said it's a right whale dolphin. So it must come from the East Coast. It's a, it's a right whale dolphin. Uh, uh, I don't know that much about that animal, that species, but I would say it's likely a Pacific resident of it. It is. Atmosphere. There's only a few of them. Okay. Well, this has been a very stimulating talk. Thank you very much. Our guest today has been Matt Larson, PhD, all the way up from Balboa, Panama. And uh, we want to say thank you so much for the good work you're doing. We've got to diminish the number of collisions between whales and ships, and thanks so much, and with that, the luncheon is adjourned. <laughs>